all the creatures, all the characters in the Bible. I think that maybe Eve has had the worst reputation for us to water. I mean, she gets blamed for everything, not just, mind you, not just for getting herself and her husband kicked out of the garden, no. Eve gets blamed for everything that has ever gone wrong in the entire history of humanity. If she hadn't eaten that truth, everything would have been fine. And I happen to believe that Eve's gotten a bad rap. I think that things are said of her that are not true, that are not found in that Genesis story. And what's more, what's worse, those things are taken and used to impugn and pile guilt upon the head of all womankind. And it's not right. And it's time that we set the record straight for poor Eve. And in, and in order to do my part in setting that record straight, I have decided this month that I'm going to spend the time to focus in on Eve and on her story. And of course, Eve's story begins, like all good stories, with the story of her origins. Now, there are two accounts in the Bible of the creation of womankind. The first found in Genesis chapter 1, the second in Genesis chapter 2. The first account is fairly simple and straightforward, and yet at the same time, deeply profound. It goes like this. Then God said, let us create humankind in our image, and according to our likeness. And then God does, as he says. And it says, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, it says. He created them. Now the first thing I want to note about that passage is how very hard it is to actually translate it. And in particular, how to translate that one word that is translated in the New Revised Standard Version that we read as humankind. What it actually says there in the original Hebrew is this. Then God said, let us create Adam in our image. Adam being the Hebrew word for a male human being. But clearly, as you read the passage, to simply define that word Adam as a male human being is not sufficient. Because it means something more than that. It means something more than just a male human being. For what, when God gets around to creating this thing he calls Adam, it says he created them in his image, male and female, he created them. So whatever Adam means, it somehow has to include both male and female. Of course, that gets even more complicated in the second account of creation, the story of Adam and Eve, because that word, Adam, is also applied to the man who's created there and ultimately becomes his name, Adam. So it gets very complicated. But that's what the word means. That somehow God creates this one humanity that includes both male and female. And that later, they are somehow divided and separated into male and female. That's an interesting way to think of the passage, and that could be what it means. That God created this one being that somehow created both natures, and that these were later divided. That is particularly interesting because, in a sense, that is what the second account of creation is actually saying. The second account of creation goes like this. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then the Lord God took one of his ribs and closed up the place with the flesh, and the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Now I know how that little episode is usually interpreted. We sort of see it as this sort of minor, minimally invasive, laparoscopic surgery. Right? God puts the man to sleep, gets a good anesthetic, puts the man to sleep, makes a small incision, takes out one small bone in the rib, and then uses that to create the woman. But again, you need to understand that, that the translation is not 
quite so simple as that. You want to know what it literally says in the Hebrew? It says this. God then put the man to sleep, put the Adam to sleep, opened up his side, and took it from it one of the bony things. And with that, made the woman. That's what it literally says. Now, translators down through the ages have said, okay, well, a good translation for a bony thing from the side might well be read, and so that's why that's the predominant translation. But it is quite possible to understand that in a very different way. We might even understand that surgery that's described there as what we might see as the separation of conjoined twins. That basically there were two beings there that God took them and surgically separated them into the two beings, the male and female. That originally there was this one united Adam that God split in two. Now I realize that that's probably a little bit hard to take literally, of course, because then you have to think of this, this first Adam running around the garden as some kind of two-headed beast. But see, the point is you're not supposed to take it literally. You were never supposed to take it literally. And even ancient people understood that. By the way, you can't even really take, you know, if you translate it as rib, you can't take that literally either. Because that would imply, therefore, that men should have one fewer rib than women. And, of course, they don't. Ancient people knew that. They understood that. They saw human skeletons often enough. They could count to 12. So they knew that this was not just about the anatomy that they were familiar with. This was something about something else. It was about human nature, what it meant to be human. It was about what it meant to relate as male and female in this world. Now, if you understand the story in that way, as a story of the separation of conjoined twins, there is absolutely no sense in which the man somehow precedes the woman. There is no sense in which the man, therefore, should dominate in some way over the women. Not at all. They're both there from the beginning. They are simply divided. Now, some people have taken it that way. Some people, you know, even the Bible at one point it says that way because Adam came first, therefore he must dominate over Eve, that men must therefore dominate over women. But that may very well be dependent on a faulty translation of the Genesis story. The point of the story is not that one should dominate over the other. The point of the story is, in fact, that we need one another, that we are dependent upon one another. That's the point of the story. For when God creates the Adam, the original human being, when he is there in the garden, God looks at the situation and says, this is not right. It is not good that the Adam should be alone. And God then tries to solve this problem, to fill this void, by creating all manner of animals and birds and bringing them to the man. And the, the animals, they're wonderful and they're beautiful and the, and the man is diverted for a while by being able to name all of them. But somehow nothing fills the void. And finally God looks at the situation and realizes that the Adam can only be satisfied, can only find meaning and purpose in life by living in relation with another of his own kind. And you cannot relate to someone without some sort of separation, without some sort of distinction. You can relate to someone who sees things differently from you, who has different experiences from you, has different approaches to life. But someone who's just exactly you, you cannot relate to, you cannot love. And so God takes up the night and separates humanity into these two parts. This solves the problem immediately. So that when the man and the woman meet again as separate individuals, the response of the man is this. 
This now is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. This one shall be called woman, Isha. In Hebrew, because out of man, Ish, she came. So now these two individuals can relate together and know one another. Now I'm not trying to suggest for any moment here that this kind of interpretation, the interpretation of the story as a kind of separation of conjoined twins, is the only way to read the story. All I'm saying is that such an interpretation is just as good as any other interpretation we have. And it's based on a translation that is just as good as the rib, traditional rib translation. So the problem with this story, the story of Adam and Eve, is that it is very old, extremely old. The Hebrew in the story is extremely archaic, older than just about anything else in the Bible. Which, of course, is an indication that this is a very old passage, a very old story. It was written well before, for example, the first account of creation in chapter 1. But because the language is so old, because the vocabulary is so different from what you find in other places, it is notoriously hard to translate. And so we should not get caught up in one particular translation, only one way of seeing it. Nobody knows for sure. As I say, I think Eve has gotten a bad rap. You know, somehow we have read the story of her in such a way as to make her guilty for the whole thing, to pile the guilt upon her. This has been a very useful thing for those down through the ages who wanted to keep women in their place, to keep them subjugated, to keep them, to make them do what you want. Without making a fuss, because you know what? Guilt and blame are great tools for supporting, for oppressing people. But I don't think she's guilty. I don't think she's the villain in this piece. I think she might even be the hero. A tragic hero, perhaps, but a hero nonetheless. And I'll look in the, in the coming weeks on, on how I see her as a hero in the story. But for the moment, I think it's worthwhile to note that the whole way we read about the story of her creation from the original Adam has contributed to making her the villain. Because if she's just an afterthought, if she's just the result of some minor surgery, if she's just a repurposed rib, then who is she? She's nobody. She doesn't have any right to speak to the serpent. She doesn't have any right to make that decision to eat of the fruit. She's being insubordinate. But I don't think it was ever intended to be read that way. God created humanity. God created Adam, this weird amalgam of male and female. Both created in God image. Both run together. And given God's image and the ability to seek wisdom and to find God in this world. And then God looked at the situation and decided that we, we needed to add a, a dimension of relationship, and so the original Adam was split into two. The point of all this is not to read that literally as a story of how it actually happened. The point is to read it as a parable of what it means to be human of what it means to be living in relationship to one another, and in particular, in relationship, male and female. It is a reminder that we are created in order to relate to one another, to live with one another, to love one another, and that in doing that, we draw closer to God's intention for us. That's what the story is about. Eve has many more lessons teach us, I am sure. And I look forward to some of those lessons in the coming weeks. But for now, let us celebrate created in God image, created to reflect God's glory here on earth. And all of us 
created to live in relationship with each other and so to reflect God's glory. Let's take a few moments and stop.